Hi, I'm Anna Gillen. You may remember me from such live streams as Future of Data Streaming Edition and Cloudera Now EMEA. <laughs> Just a little Simpsons reference there because today we are talking Simpsons, but in a data science context. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Future of Data virtual meetup. My name is Anna Gillen, as I said, and I'm a senior solution engineer in the UK team at Cloudera. I'm also the host of the Future of Data London meetup. So hello again to those of you who've joined us before and hello to all of our new friends. Unfortunately, we can't be together in person, but thanks to the magic of the internet, today's presentation will be live streamed straight to your home office on YouTube, LinkedIn, and even Twitter, which I didn't know was a thing, but apparently so. And while we can't chat over pizza and beer in the office, we can chat online. So wherever you're watching, um, there should be a live chat function available. So have a look for it and let's have a little practice. Find the chat and, and say hi, tell us where you're from. Um, you know, Maybe you'll find a neighbor that you can socially distanced talk about data science or something with. You know, let, let's, let's try and make some new friends. Uh, there's people, yeah, we've got people already all over the place telling us hello. So hi, thank you for joining us so much. Right, so in uh, just a moment, I'll be handing over to my colleague, Jeff Fletcher, coming to you live from his office in the Netherlands. He'll be taking a data science problem that's very close to his heart and trying to solve it in a couple different ways. So please feel free to just ask questions as we go in the live chat, just like we practice right now. Uh, we'll be monitoring for any incoming questions and we'll have an opportunity for a live Q&A session with Jeff right after this demo. So do please ask whatever you like. We might also be able to answer a few questions in real time as we monitor the chat. So let's let's keep the conversation flowing, guys. So I really do encourage you to ask as many questions as you like because those who take part in the chat will be in the running to win some really great swag, if I do say so myself, provided to us by the Cloudera community team. So you have to be in it to win it. Stick around to the end to see if you win in our live prize draw where we'll pick two lucky winners uh, for the prize packages pictured. Um, I actually have the speaker in the second place prize, so highly recommend it as good, good base. So also thanks in advance to the supporting cast um, that we have uh, behind the scenes helping to run this meetup. So Tui and Bill, thank you so much, and Shelby as well for the community promotion. Uh, so with that, let me introduce you to my colleague, Jeff Fletcher. Jeff is Cloudera's machine learning specialist in Europe and has some great insight into practical ways to solve data science problems, which we'll learn about today. Jeff is also, I think, apparently, the world's biggest Simpsons fan. So hello, Jeff. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm the world's biggest Simpsons fan. I'm a like medium-sized Simpsons fan. I have like some specific caveats around my Simpson fandom. I don't only own any more any Simpsons paraphernalia, but I do have a fairly deep, almost encyclopedic knowledge of the early seasons of The Simpsons. And we'll get into that as part of the demo. <laughs> All right, can't wait. So you're one of these people that's finding like Nostradamus-like predictions in the early se Simpsons seasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've been pretty accurate around US politics recently. So. That's true. <laughs> That's true. All right, Jeff, so I'll uh, I'll leave you to it and I'll be back afterwards with Q&A. See you in a bit. Thank you. All right, let's get the screen share back up again. All righty. So the agenda for today is a little bit about me and my love of The Simpsons, how we get to be here in the first place. Then I want to talk about mapping the concept of uh, the happiest Simpsons character to a standard machine learning workflow. There's kind of two main parts to the body of work that we're going to uh, be demoing. The first one is, oh, let me get that guy out of the way. All right, go on. Uh, we have the actual data analytics part, so that how we do the data analysis. Then we're going to take the data analysis, and we're going to actually go through the process of deploying a model. So we're actually going to make new predictions of a new sentence based on uh, the analysis of the Simpsons. Then as a quick wrap up, Q&A, um, and then the prizes, the wonderful prizes that Anna spoke about at the start. So uh, I'm on the right screen. Right. I 
don't consider myself a pure breed data scientist. I actually started as an electrical engineer. I have some of a mathematical background, but like the people that I meet uh, working at my customers is specifically around data science are usually from a maths perspective, far better than me. So I don't know if you remember that particular episode of The Simpsons where uh, they're talking, where I think it's Lisa the vegetarian, where she's, uh, they go through to the meat factory and uh, they're busy talking about why meat is bad. Uh, and uh, that I think that is actually Troy McClure there, uh, who says, let's just ask the scientician. So I'm more kind of in that category. I'm an aspirant machine learning person and data scientist, but I'm still, I'd have to convert the, the last part of my title there. The other thing is I'm still kind of on my machine learning journey. This is something that I'm getting better at over time, but there's a specific Simpsons uh, quote that I often use. Homer is trying to get fit again, and he's running around at night, and he sees a gym. And he walks up to the gym, and he goes, a guy? What's a guy? And then he walks inside, and he sees people training and kind of working out, and he goes, oh, a guy. And I feel my machine learning journey is often very similar to that. I think I've learned something, and then I read about it in a different context, and I realize, actually, what I thought I learned, I hadn't learned. This is kind of a continuously evolving field, but it is just an expression I use when I think I've actually learned something, but actually I haven't. And then the last point is I like, I, I started watching The Simpsons in 1991, 92. Um, I was at university in South Africa. The Simpsons was something that was not broadcast on television there. So my friends and I had another friend who lived in Canada who would uh, make VHS tapes and post them to us so that we could watch The Simpsons. It's what I call the glory days of analog piracy when the only way to actually get a copy of something was someone had to tape it and send it for you. And we would all gather and we would sit and we would watch the show. This particular picture is something my daughter drew for me for my last birthday. It's kind of, she just took the family and she drew it as a Simpsons representation. So this sits on my desk and um, it's a kind of like, a clear indicator of where we get to. I'm a fair believer that The Simpsons stopped being interesting after season 14. There's a lot of people who have written about this academically. And uh, it, I think it is the episode where Seymour Skinner becomes on in Tanzarian, where we kind of go and learn his particular history. I like after that, I know it's it's okay, but it's not amazingly funny. There's a couple of really good episodes on YouTube that talk about how the change in the writer writing happened and how The Simpsons fell apart. but from season three to season eight, I know that very well. You could put me in front of the last epi last exit to Springfield episode, turn the volume off, and I could probably recite it word for word. So I'm a big fan of the early part of The Simpsons. I'm not a fan of all of The Simpsons, but when I got the opportunity to do this particular project, I jumped at it because I thought it would actually be particularly interesting. So one of the things I want to talk about here is doing machine learning in production the part that actually tends to be the easier part is the ML code part. Like you're going to go and grab some stuff. I've pre-built the code for you, but it's putting everything together. That's actually really the difficulty. And one of the things I'm extending this to do is not just building a model, but actually we're going to put one in production and we'll have something that we can interact with like live to be able to say, here's a new sentence. Tell me what you think about that sentence. And I think one of the specific reasons for this issue at the moment is that a lot of machine learning projects and a lot of machine learning implementations, uh, a lot of companies have failed to get this right. And as we start to have more uh, scrutiny around it, because a lot of money gets spent on machine learning problems, and this is something that we are attempting to focus on and deal with as Cloudera, is actually getting things into production. Because at some point, the people who've been paying the money, I want to know what value is being delivered back. So a lot of the projects that I build for Cloudera are focused on that specifically. We have another webinar coming up that will be maybe a little bit more corporate and slightly less Simpsons-y that is focused on how to do this around churn. But the project I'm building here actually gets you to, from data source, data ingest, uh, uh, machine learning, data science, and model, model deployment, model training, model into production. I have removed some of the Cloudera scaffolding from this in order to make it possible for you to use it outside of an environment. Our environment makes it easier. That's fundamentally what we do. But this is something that I'm attempting to provide capacity to get machine learning models into production by understanding all of the steps in the process, not just the pure machine learning uh, side. So 
This is a standard machine learning workflow that I often see being implemented. Now, the business input with this for this to be, we need to build a sentiment uh, analysis process. And we want to, uh, so that we can in real time interact with someone, maybe via a chatbot or whatever it might be. The data science here is to understand the shape of the data that we have, come up with a plan to make that model, then train the model and then put it into production. There is kind of model operation stuff, stuff that we get into a little bit more detail than some of the other webinars. But today we want to do focus on the data science part and the model training part using something that's maybe a little bit more fun, a little bit more kind of uh, left the field. But we want to build and create a sentiment classifier using the Simpsons data. So there is a specific thing that I'm going to be using today. There's something called the AFIN table. Now, the AFIN table, I thought, was something that meant affinity the first time I read it. I was wrong because that's A, not how you would spell affinity. But it comes from Finn Arup Nielsen, who created this table. What it does, and this is an important thing, and we'll see some of this in the code, but he went and took a bunch of words and he gave it a valence. So valence is like a whether it's positive or whether it's negative. So there is a list of words, and we're going to be having a look at this. But is the one thing that probably just required that I call out specifically. So how did I put a concept of sentiment into this? I'm using the AFIN table. And where does it come from? This Dane, not a Finn, was the person who created it for us. So we're now going to jump into the code. All right. Starting point is the GitHub repo for this. Everything that I'm doing, I'm doing in R. Um, and I'm also using Sparkly R. Sparkly R is the uh, R interface to Apache Spark, which is a distributed processing system. And we're going to be using uh, the distributed, we're going to be using the hooks that Sparkly R provide in order to be able to uh, do this. My focus here is to specifically on R users to try and understand a combination of things. How do you get to machine learning using R? And how do you actually get to the point where you are having and implementing um, the distributed processing power? Because right now we're using a smallish data set. But when you want to scale up, you need to have the capacity to do this. And this code will very easily switch between single mode, which is the way I'm running it now, to kind of big distributed mode as well. So. This is where the repo is. We'll provide this as a link uh, to you after the project. But it's on my GitHub. My GitHub is Fletch Jeff. Just uh, search for Simpsons, and then you can find it. OK, so starting point is I need some access to capacity to do this. We have the Cloudera machine learning platform, which is kind of an interface for our data scientists for data scientists to get access to some capacity to be able to run a particular project. Here is my Simpsons sentiment analysis project. You can see a bunch of other stuff that I'm working on at the moment. But this is the one we're going to be using. So I'm clicking in here, and it's taking me into this project. I basically took this, and I cloned. I did this as a clone from that repo. So I grabbed that repo, and here is all of the capacity or all of the files. Next step is I need to run. I need some resources. So normally, you would do this on your laptop. You would have uh, your laptop open. You might like fire up RStudio. In our world, we do it this way because of uh, the kind of like ease of access and the ability to get whatever capacity I need. So I'm going to start a new session, and then I'm going to choose how I want to, uh, what capacity I want for that session. So R Studio, because we're working in R, that's the default editor that I'm going to run. And how big a session do I want? Well, actually, I'm doing something fairly complex in memory, so I need a fairly big session. And then I click Start Session, and it will start. Now. I've pre-baked and pre-warmed a lot of the stuff that you're going to be seeing today because we don't want to wait uh, for all of the stuff to run, like the model training of pre-run. So here it is. I am now inside my R Studio session. So this is connecting me securely through uh, the browser to a container that's running on the other side. And here I have all of my R. This is basically the first part, which is the data analysis part. I did this as an R markdown uh, notebook. So you can download the code, and you can run NIT, and NIT will uh, deploy it all for you. There's so a couple of things I want to talk about. And fundamentally, what we're doing is we're walk walking through code, talking through decisions that were made, why I'm doing things this way, how we're going to work with it. But this is what we're going to uh, be going through. So we need to create a Spark session. In fact, I'm going to drop, jump over to the actual notebook. So I knitted the notebook, and this is the output. So these are the libraries we're using. We're in dplyr world, so we're in the tidyverse. So we're going to be using that. 
Sparkly R is the mechanism that allows my R code to use dplyr-like syntax to be able to do things that you understand well, like a filter or a mutate uh, or an aggregate or whatever it is, but it's the standard things that you would do on a data frame is mapped to the corresponding Spark SQL code to be able to do the same thing. So we load the libraries. We also need ggplot and themes because I like my uh, things to look a certain way. And we're going to create the Spark connection. Now, I'm doing this in local mode first, right? So local mode means my uh, session, the container that I'm running is going to spin up. And I'm also going to get the Spark driver and executor inside that single memory map. And I say to it, I want you to only use 8 gig of memory, the memory fraction, how much of the heap you can use, a bunch of stuff that's important to know. But if you remove the, the local part and change it to yarn client, then it will um, go into distributed mode. There's a lot of stuff that we provide as part of the Cloudera machine learning that makes the distributed mode just easier. The only thing you have to do um, is uh, uncomment these lines, make that change, and then the distributed mode works. Like we use Spark on Kubernetes, so it will automatically go and create those nodes, and it will run and do everything happily for you. So we need to read in our CSV data. CSV data actually comes from a Kaggle competition. So this is the, the Kaggle competition. It's all of the lines of dialogue from The Simpsons uh, based on character name and what they said across 27 seasons, I think. So there's quite a lot, but uh, it's still not massive. It's not like really, really big data. It is small enough that I can include it with the repo without any concern, which is why I can run this in local mode. But as you want to start to scale up, changing it into yarn client mode means it would still work the same way. So here we have uh, an example. So Ms. Hoover says, no, actually, it was a little bit of both, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we have. We know that this is the character who said it is the first column. And then what they said is the next. So we're going to read this CSV with Spark. So we're going to tell Spark to go and read this. If your data is, if you're in distributed mode, this is the one thing you need to think about is that where did you put that data? Like, where does it exist? Where have you actually put it? So we're going to load it up and you can see this is what it says. So that's what the characters say. Um, and the, well, that's what they said. And this is who the character is. So we're just displaying the table. The other thing that we need to load up is that AFIN table list. And this is the AFIN table list. It's just the same thing. This time it's a tab separate. No, it's also comma separated but it is the, uh, a word and it's valence. So word like abandon is a negative word. So it has a negative two connotation to it. So we're loading that up. It's its own table. So now we have all of the dialogue as a uh, data frame in Spark, and we have this uh, AFIN table as a data frame in Spark. So that gets us to this point. So you can see this is what we have, and we can get all the way to the end. Let's see if we get down right to the end. Yeah, so distracted is minus two. Where's something positive? Do I have anything that's positive? No. Seems like uh, all the words in and around, they're displeased. Uh, one, two, it's fun. The first one. There we go. Ability. Ability is a positive word. So we have valence, we have positive and negative words. Right. We need to create local references so you can work with this inside Spark um, and inside your R Studio. So we create that. Um, and you can see that there are 158,000 lines of dialogue. So it's not massive, but it's big enough that using Spark actually makes this stuff a little bit easier. I find sometimes with R, memory management above 2 gig for a total data set size becomes a little problematic, and I find it just easier. You're not changing the way you write. You're not having to think about the syntax differently like you are with PySpark. It remains in the dplyr-like realm. It's just uh, starts to work that way. So we need to do some basic data cleaning. I just needed to rename that. I could probably have changed this at the start, but you know, when you're doing things quickly, you don't always think about this through. We need to drop the, uh, there are certain things in it that are actually RNA. So I think during the read, I might've had an extra comma or something, but it doesn't drop significantly. It gets us to 131,000 uh, lines. And we can see who says the most during the uh, who says the most during the the episode. So Homer talks the most by at least double. So like that, I found quite interesting. He says a lot of stuff compared to everybody else. He's a very very chatty guy. This is number of lines of dialogue. So we can see Moses lack. Um, 
and C. Montgomery Burns, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the people and the most of the things that they say. Grandpa Simpson, my favorite Grandpa Simpson quote, and one I use a lot now that I've moved to the Netherlands and I've discovered that it's very cold here is um, when, I think it's Treehouse of Horror 2, the one with The Shining, where they find him and he goes, I'm cold and there are wolves after me. So this is one of my favorite quotes. I also love his whole long thing, the the uh, last exit to Springfield, where they, he's the... Um, the strike busters and they talk about having an onion on my belt on, on his belt in university days i could actually quote that verbatim but you know you get a little bit older and you, you have to forget some things like one of my other favorite homer simpson's quote and he said every time i learn something new i forget something else like the time i took that home wine making course and forgot how to drive and marge says that's because you were drunk and homer says and how so yeah <laughs> I think like for that those particular seasons, like three through eight, I would actually probably take on most people for a, a trivia uh, thing. Like, quick question, if you're going to respond, what's the comic book guy's real name? Does anyone know? Let's see if we can uh, have it in the chat. I'm not going to get a response, but we'll see how everyone uh, comes back with. And the other thing, and this is for me, please, if you're going to give it a review, please just say worst webinar ever. I think that would just make it ideal. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, text mining. We now need to process this text. We need to actually go through a process of making it ready so that the uh, we can start to do some work with it. So the first thing we want to do is we need to do some uh, punctuation. We need to remove the punctuation from it because punctuation words don't, they're not words like, and it's interesting because we could use exclamation points as an identifier for whether um, someone, like it, it's an emphasis thing. So I have seen this with some of the more uh, recent deep learning algorithms where they actually then go and look at, they will include punctuation because I'm happy, full stop is different to I'm happy exclamation point. It adds more weight to it. But for now, we're going to remove the punctuation. We also need to tokenize. We need the individual words as a vector rather than a sentence because we want to process kind of word by word. We need to remove stop words. So stop words are short words like uh, the, uh, and things that don't have contextual uh, uh, relevance to something like sentiment. Um, and so we remove all of those. And in the, uh, we can also then push this back to Hive. So in the Cloud Area Machine Learning land, I would just go and push this back to Hive because it's then easier for retrieval for other steps as we go along. So now we get to the question of who is the happiest Simpson? How are we actually going to calculate that? Okay, so we want to do a conversion. We want to take the sentences and we need to have a look at what they look like when we have uh, tokenized this. So this takes, goes through the process of stop word removal, punctuation removal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this sentence here breaks down into this is a word, actually little, sometimes disease magazines from this. No, actually, it was a little of both, sometimes when. So you can see that our action of text mining is bubbling up what are the most important words in that sentence that would have the a likely relevance around context of meaning. This is where we get into probably the more difficult part. There's a lot of nuance around something like natural uh, or sentiment analysis. And there are people who are far better at this than me who understand what is necessary to make this very accurate. I have an approach and I have an approach that's reasonable. I don't necessarily have what I would consider the best approach to this, but it works. So we can focus on like getting something going. This is also something where we talked about my initial point is that having a model in production that might be 80% accurate is more useful than having a model that's 95% accurate that never sees the light of day. So we have a plan that we have towards getting this. So now we've got our individual words per sentence and we're gonna join each of those words with that AFIN table. So I'm gonna go and do kind of, uh, this is an inner join. So I'm gonna take the word actually, and I'm gonna join it with the AFIN table, and it's gonna give that word a value. So now we're starting to add a numerical representation for each word in each sentence. So the first thing it kind of gives us that, um, th that overall view. So you can see that the, the sentence has, uh, and we sum them. So we basically take, the overall value uh, for this. 
and we group by it. So Homer, you promised, promised being the word that gives it a positive value. Then if we have a look at, I've never been in so embarrassed in my life. It was such a great scene. That's where um, Homer gets very, very drunk. And uh, the next morning, well, in, as they're going to bed, Marge says to him, I've never been so embarrassed in my life. And Homer looks at her and goes, why? What did you do? <laughs> but, yeah. Anyway, as I said, encyclopedic knowledge of that particular era of The Simpsons. So we have now created a value for each sentence, and we are uh, starting to um, kind of like add the total number. So if it's negative words and positive words, it's kind of giving it a, a, a general value at the end. But we also want to have a look at maybe we don't want to take the total value because a longer sentence is going to start to have more words. But something like I hate you as a sentence is very strong. So we probably want to give it a weighted sum. We want to take the average of the number of words in the sentence um, it divided by the, the, or the value divided by the number of words in the sentence. So we start creating this concept of a weighted sum summary. So we take the sentence, all of the values, the SDF describe. So if you've ever used the summary function inside R, this is the sparkly R equivalent and comes back and tells you the number of words, the uh, average for it, the standard deviation, min, max, et cetera. So you can see the minimum is a very negative sentence of minus 77 and the maximum is something like uh, is 444. So obviously a very, very, very positive sentence. But sentiment, we want a sentiment classifier that's going to give us a single value kind of per, per sentence. So. I, the first time I did this, I tried this as a standard linear regression problem rather than a logistic regression problem. And if you actually do a density plot of this, you can see that this is the histogram of sentiment per, uh, per line of dialogue. And it's kind of bimodal. You have the negative two being like uh, where you have a peak around sentences. So things are generally more positive than negative, which is good because you can see this in the, the average. But this shows you that we have like things that are around here, we're going to consider more positive and things that are around here, we're going to consider negative. So I am going to choose to say anything that is above here, I'm going to consider positive, so around the mean, and anything that is below that, I'm going to consider negative. This is not very scientific. This is based on my assumptions around this. I think it's reasonable. It gives me a reasonable result. You could probably argue the nuance of whether we should do this as weighted sum or keep the actual values in. That is something that if you can take this and further it and get the model better, then I'm absolutely happy. Send it to me and I'll make the changes to it. But this graph is what basically what we're looking at around that. So now we can start to calculate per line of text or per line of dialogue, a weighted sum for those particular characters. So we can say, take each sentence, take the value, add it up, divide it by the number of lines that they have said, and that actually should give us the value. But there are many, many, many Simpsons characters. So we only want to do this for the top 30. So what we're doing here, and you can see this is where we get to, it's very similar to standard D plier syntax. We're doing a mutate. This explode stop words basically takes those individual things, but it rewraps it. So it takes it as line, uh, reconverts it into that single sentence and then adds it all together for us. Then we want to select um, and filter for words. So, so you want for sentences that are greater than two words big. And we're going to then come up with the top uh, characters. And we're also going to come up with what they said. So by joining that with our AFIN table, so the top characters, the sentences that they've said, uh, joined with the AFIN table together, and we're summarizing it by the weighted sum of the total value of the, all of their sentences divided by the number of sentences that they said. Starts to, ooh, I'm starting to give, away, give it away. So this gets us to the point where we can now create a list of what each character and how happy they are based on how happy the dialogue is using the AFIN table to map each word divided by the total number of sentences that they said. And the happiest character is Lenny Leonard. Now, if you're a Simpsons fan, you know that Lenny is probably in love with Carl. And he says a lot of very, very nice things about him. And that does kind of make sense to me because like he is a generally happy character, even in adversity, he says happy things. Barney Gumbel, who is the drunk, is generally quite comfortable with who he is. Marge, we know, is a good person. Ned Flanders should be in the top. 
But Ned occasionally has negative moments. Like Ned, the um, the episode where Homer wants to uh, join their family, and he says, "In a more perfect world, we'd be one family called the Flimpsons." Like there, at the end, he gets very, very upset with Homer and starts to shout at him. So he shouldn't actually be the happiest character because there are moments where he doesn't uh, say things quite well. Comic book book guy. I don't know who responded, but it's Jeff Albertson. That's his name. Anyone know what Apu's surname is? Apu Nahasapi Mapetalon, the announcer. That is a happy guy. So that gets us through to through to this, and we can now uh, print it out using ggplot, and that gives us this list. So we can see that this is where we get to Barney Gumble, the least happy of the characters who say the most. There probably would be another character inside the more extended list, but Doctor Hibbert, who we know is generally jovial, probably says a lot of sad things or unhappy things because he often has to deliver bad news. So it would make sense that he would be uh, down lower down. And Grounds Creeper Willie is just generally cantankerous. So based on my applied knowledge or understanding of The Simpsons, I'm okay with this outcome. I don't think this is a terrible sentiment classification process. It gets us to the point that we're able to do that and frankly, we should have known. Like Carl uh, Lenny is just a very, very happy guy. He is the guy that uh, we would all, well, you know, if I'm going to have someone write a newspaper about me, I would like it to be Lenny. So that gets us to the point where we've done this analysis. We have now done some data. We've done uh, some data and analysis. We've gotten to the point where we can put a sentiment value to each of those 130,000 valid lines of dialogue. And we know that Lenny being the uh, happiest character, we could leave it there. But what I wanted to do was take the next step and say, how do I take this and actually build a machine learning model based on top of it, keeping within the R world. So now we're going to jump back to here to our code and we're going to start having a look at a couple of other, um, a couple of the processes. So this second file, um, this script basically just writes everything out that we've done. So it follows that same process, but it now just saves it as a parquet file because what I actually want is I want labeled data. But there's two other things that it does. So it doesn't just add the value, it adds um, classifications to each one. So you can see that I'm adding a positive if it is above the mean or a negative if it, or if it is below. The other thing I'm doing is a multi-class classifier. So that's just a binary classifier, is positive or is negative. But if I actually switch to multi-class, so we saw it was bimodal. So I said, OK, let's take everything that's greater than 2 and make that positive. Everything that's uh, less than neg negative 2 and make that uh, negative. And anything in between, you're going to make that neutral. So now I have three layers of classification. The reason I did this, actually, was when I trained the BERT model, which I'll talk about in a moment, it has its own built-in um, classifier. And I found that the uh, standard logistic regression for Spark worked better, but this is the reason I did this, and then I just kept it in. The thing I wasn't sure about is greater than and equal to two, or because there's many values that are exactly two, or greater than two. So that's debatable. Um, it's worth trying. You can always like uh, refit and see whether you uh, prefer the results that come from it. But we save this out as uh, a file that we can use later, and it is the sentence, the weighted sum, and the binary classifiers that come with it. And in our next step, we're going to build a word. Uh, we're going to start building the models. So, the important thing to think about here is we're we're jumping into parts of uh, NLP, which is the idea of word embeddings. Word embeddings is the concept of taking a, um, a the necessity here is I need to take a sentence and I need to create a numeric representation. The way logistic regression works is I have a column of numbers, and I have a target variable, and I'm trying to run a prediction to say, with these many, many columns of numbers, please try and predict that. Our columns need to be the same all the way through, and we need a way of doing that numeric representation. This is something called word embeddings, which is the concept of taking a sentence or taking individual words and converting them into a numeric representation. There is a lot to unpack here. Like there's a huge amount of stuff that happens and not something I want to get into here, A, because I don't know the mathematics well enough to talk with confidence about 
how these particular processes work. This is one of those guy moments for me where I think I know how word to vec works, but I don't want to be the person who says that I do. And um, we, I am going to take a code and referencing from other people because I can, because that's how the internet works. I'm just able to implement and get something going. Word to vec and the other one, which is a newer one, is something called BERT are two processes that you can run through to get a numeric representation of, uh, of a, a set of words. So we load, we're gonna load up our sentence scores from the previous one, and we're gonna start going through the word to vec process. We still need to go through the same thing about doing stop word removal, um, removing the punctuation, tokenizing, etc. But now we're gonna build this inside a Sparkly R pipeline just to facilitate, to make this easier. And there is this remove punctuation. It's not actually a standard function. It's a function I created. Think of it as like a Spark UDF. It's a new function that I've built that I can use in here using a function that is a real function. Well, like real as in something that's part of the library, uh, the dplyr transformer. So I want to transform um, some data into that format. And then I want to tokenize, remove stop words. And then this is a function that happens to implement Spark's word to vec feature. So Spark's word to vec feature takes the body of words that I have, the document, and runs the word to vec algorithm on it and creates a mathematical representation for me. I'm going to fit that here. So I'm going to fit that against uh, the word to vec pipeline, against the sentence scores. It takes a while. It takes a very, very long time. So this is one of the reasons. Well, as in long time, like long enough for you to go get coffee, maybe watch half an episode of the simpsons you could probably watch one of like the early ones when they were on the tracy ullman show and then you'd be done so that doesn't the fit i save this because this is a transformation that i would want to use again later so it takes a sentence and will transform it and create something that looks like this at the end and then when i run the transform so you see what what it looks like when i'm actually running my transformation it's the words that someone said the weighted sum the binary classification, the multi-class classification, then the word list, these are parts of the steps that has actually happened. And then the result. The result is the actual vector that has been calculated. So just so you understand, word to vec is gonna fit against all the words knowing it's a skip gram based model. So it, it, it works on groups of words up to a certain size, and then it kind of looks at the relevance to that. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create similarities around the context of words. What people often talk about is king is related to queen as the same way man is related to woman. It is just creates representations so that we understand that they are similar enough and it creates kind of a vector space representation for this. Before that sentence, I wanna have a look. I can grab, it actually comes out as this. This is the vector representation. So it is 400 uh, individual elements in this. That's basically what um, the result column is, so you can see it's a double, uh, is, well, it's double, it's 400 big. And if I just grab one of them, so if I grab the result, this is what it looks like. So now we have this column that is a representation that we have mapped, and it's 400 uh, big. It's basically, it's a, a dense vector that's 400 big against my classifier that I calculated in the previous step. So now we can build a model that's going to go and make predictions against it. So we're doing ML logistic regression. So it's a standard logistic regression model for the binary classifier versus the result. And we want to see how well it works. If you actually run this prediction, but it takes a while. So I don't know if I necessarily need to run it. Uh, in fact, maybe I did run it earlier. Is this one that I ran earlier? Yeah. So it comes out at 89% accurate. So it's 89% accurate based on that, that data. This is a weird, like that result is very, very difficult to pause because I like I, I don't feel that this is real world data. It actually is kind of 89% accurate representation of how the Simpsons dialogue maps to what values words should have from some guy in Finland. And we get an 89% accuracy for that. Like if you're just talking to say your boss who doesn't understand machine learning, say it's 89% accurate and you'll uh, get in, like everyone's happy, but you do need to think about this a little bit, like understand that where it comes from, is this really valid, is it not? But we have something that's working. We can get a classifier that is 89% against the holdout test set, and we uh, it seems reasonable. Then we're gonna save this model because we wanted to use it again for the actual model deployment. There is another path 
that we can run that does the same thing. And it also gives us a numeric representation, but it's using something called a BERT model. BERT model is a transformer. It is something that was developed, I think, mostly at Google. Um, they were they created, there's a paper about all you need is attention, and it understands like the concept of models. GPT-2, things that are often in the news work in a similar way, but it is a pre-trained model. We don't actually train it, but the important thing here is we're using something called Spark NLP, which is a library from Jon Snow Labs. This is a wrapper to go and use the Jon Snow Labs Spark library inside Sparkly R. And this is actually the main thing. It's quite memory intensive. So when I run it, I actually increase the size of the Spark driver. It goes through the same thing. It, it has its own helper library. So it's going to assemble a document because it needs it to look a certain way. It does tokenizing. Normalizing is the idea of uh, making everything lowercase, removing punctuation. Um, just kind of normalizing it, getting to, to the point that I, uh, that I did with the regular expression for word to vec. There's a stop words cleaner that removes uh, stop words for us. And then we build the same pipeline. So we're doing, it's almost exactly the same. And the, uh, the one of the things about word to vec is word to vec understands that if you give it a label class that is either positive or negative, it does string indexing. And string indexing is kind of standard requirement for machine learning. But that's what you're going to build. So now we're going to do and train a BERT model. So this is the pipeline that does it. It actually saves the pipeline for transformation. And we create that and we do the same thing. So now um, we're doing this test against the data set. So we uh, do train split. We can't run standard multi uh, binary classifier. So because of uh, some of the, it, it's now three levels. So this comes back as about 70% accurate when you run it. Um, and 70% accurate is not fantastic, but it's not awful either against that. I think if I were to change the value of that minus two and plus two from greater than to greater than equals, it might actually become a little bit more accurate here. It's something worth testing. You can try and sort of see different ways. And then as part of the process, it plots out a confusion matrix. Um, so if you run this, it just does take a while. So I'm going to run it now, but then we save the model. So now we have two models. We have two trained models that have been trained on the labeled data that we created in the previous set that we now want to put into production. So now we want to take this and we actually want to go and make it so that people can interact with it. So in Cloudera Machine Learning, we have a, uh, the ability to go and host and run applications. But I'm actually just going to build this like in a, a, a live application uh, scenario. So I'm just going to run it and it will uh, post and put and uh, host a shiny based application inside our environment. This part here, this is very CML specific. So you would like change that to port to this line over here before you run it. But we load the models that we trained previously. So here are the models. So this is, I'm actually using my Spark models to go and do new real time predictions. You can do this. You can do it. It works really well in Spark local mode. This gets its memory overhead is much smaller because you're making individual predictions rather than multiple predictions. So we load those models, both the pipelines for transformation and the actual models themselves. And we have this function here, which is get result. So what the result function is going to do is going to take a new sentence and make a new prediction because it kind of creates a single row data frame. And then um, we'll make a prediction based on that. So I build this inside a shiny app and I deploy the Shiny app, and that gets us to, in fact, I'll just open it again from here. Here's my Shiny application that I'm running, and here is my application. So my test sentence is, I was born in Oaf and I'll die in Oaf, um, which is, of course, from Treehouse of Horror, where Homer is a dunce. Fantastic episode with George Cauldron. It's just really, really good. Early stage Simpsons was where it was at, and we can get sentiment. So this sentiment is sentence is negative, so it is now making a prediction on this sentence, and it says it's negative, and we're 99.9% .9 sure that's negative. And that makes sense. The word die is in there. It seems really good. We can also do it against a BERT model. So now it's going to do the same thing. It's going to run against the BERT model. The BERT model also says that um, that was a negative sentence. So it says, and with 70% confidence, that that particular one. So it's remember, it's positive, neutral, and negative. So that's probably neutral, positive, and negative. So we're reasonably sure that that sentence is, uh, is doing well. Let's try something and say, uh, my wait, this meetup 
meet up all the ends is amazing and wonderful. So not only is it true, but we can test to see whether that's a positive sentiment or not. And yeah, positive. We're 99% sure that, yeah, there we go. My machine learning algorithm agrees with me that you are both an amazing and wonderful audience. So it must be working. And let's run a BERT model again and see the same thing. BERT model says, yeah, definitely uh, positive and very, very certain that it's positive. And let's just try one more that's a little bit neutral and say this, uh, this demo uh, is nearly done. And see what we say. This comes back. That should actually be like, yeah. So you can see it's positive, but it's not really sure. It's not necessarily getting um, like much certainty to it. So it's positive, but it's 54%. And what does Bert say? Bert should come back as neutral. Uh, neutral, yeah. So this is now showing that it's reasonable. People can agree with the results that are coming back. But the important thing is we've gone through a whole process here of getting to the point that we've put our model into production. So not only did we learn that Lenny is the happiest of the Simpsons characters, but we also figured out a way of using and doing real-time sentiment analysis using that information. Alrighty, so I am going to say the resources for this is that is my GitHub repo. That's the place that you probably want to be um, to be able to go and get access to the code and copy what I've done. We have a similar uh, webinar coming up that focuses on doing churn analytics, and we're going to kind of delve into the same thing. Um, and yeah, we're going to switch over now to Q and A. Okay, great. You can unshare your screen, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> I hit the button, but it failed to like be properly. <laughs> Really great presentation. Thank you. I think number one, you've inspired me to go and watch The Simpsons because I don't think I've watched it for some time. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's a good time. You, you really are a fan. I don't know. There's there's no one there's no one here who claims to be a bigger fan. So like, you've not been challenged yet. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> me. Ask me anything as long as it's pre-season fourteen. Having said that, we did did we did have Jake Jacobson and Rosie Fish get um, comic book black guys real names, so I don't know they might be they might be contenders. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, we've had uh, we're going to flip to our Q and A as you said. So thank you for everyone to everyone for your participation. Um, it's great to see the level of enthusiasm and also people having a little bit of fun with your presentation, Jeff. So we've had a, we've had a couple questions, um, but I think, you know, we can, it's a good, um, it's a good prompt for some discussion. I mean, number one, uh, aforementioned Rosie Fish uh, said about the uh, book on the mathematics of the Simpsons, guessing that is given to you every Christmas, <laughs> you know, about eight copies of it, Simon Singh's book. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually, there are quite a few different, like, analyses that have been done on the simpsons a lot of it is about like the um the sort of the amount of things that the characters say how things have changed over time some of it is just like an analysis of how things change with regards to writing like this for me was more fun project about trying to understand how to push this into production in r because like that's actually an impediment for a lot of a lot of r people tend to be more statistical than they are like kind of pure um computer science or, or like code based to so say like, well, here's something that you can just fairly quickly put into production, then you can go and unpick and like do the proper maths behind it. Mm -hmm. But it's making a prediction, which means it's useful, rather than like just knowing that Len like knowing that Lenny is in one context, the happiest Simpson does not make for a uh, useful business proposition. Yeah, no, indeed. I mean, that there's obviously the two sides of data science that we usually have is the descriptive and is the predictive. Yeah. Um, you know, that there's there's value obviously in both, and you need to do the first one if you can do the second one. And I think sometimes people, I know what I see sometimes my customers, they go straight to we have to do AI, but they don't know <laughs> <laughs> what data they actually have and what insights they can get, you know, from the data that's that's already there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's 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 nice. Um, so there's there's a couple of related questions from Liz and Rahul. Um, I think maybe we can talk a little bit about this. It's it's kind of about, you know, it is natural language processing. I'm not sure how much kind of uh, expertise you have within it, but you know, do we have a way to detect things like sarcasm or to consider 
words in their context. You know, obviously, um, you know, uh, Rahul's asking whether the AFIN table or your BERT model consider that context, whether they look at sarcasm. How, how do we how do we handle those kind of natural language phenomena? So that is where we get to the complexity of nuance, right? So like how someone says something in the context of the show has a much bigger impact to it. So like take natural language. If we try to just do text, like there, there is a, there's a great uh, episode where um, Homer gets stuck in this like endless sarcasm loop and he can't stop saying things sarcastically. So if you say it sarcastically, but you actually don't mean it sarcastically because there's kind of this weird multiple layers to the joke, that is very nuanced. Now, sarcasm is sometimes very, very hard to detect. This is where the labeling is important. A machine learning algorithm is only as good as the data that's going in. This AFIN table is reasonable, but it's not done by like people. If I got each line that was then uh, reviewed by, say, 10 people, each of them did like however 130,000 lines and then labeled it themselves, but they'd also have to watch the context. That level of labeling would make our models be better at it. And like you could also have something to say that there's a flag to say this is sarcastic or it's not. So you can have like sentiment and sarcasm attached to it and the model can learn. So a deep learning model, like a BERT based model, would be able to extract that, but that requires people to have labeled it ahead of time. You there is no easy way of inferring sarcasm using this process. This is where like, you need to be a little bit more robust in the methodology. That's why like the labeled data sets are for this type are like definitely gold. So there's like the IMDB one, there's the Twitter Senti, I think that's the Senti 140 list. So there are those that exist. This mechanism doesn't account for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think this is probably one of the the most interesting for me, at least data science problems right now is like, how do we get those labeled data sets? You know, how do we actually make sure that, you know, the predictions we're making are accurate because, you know, people, machine labeled stuff doesn't always get, you know, the nuances that, that people, you know, have, right? So it's, um, yeah, I imagine this is something we'll see evolve over time as well. There, there is also a, in fact, this is one of the Fast Forward Labs reports on, I think it's called Learning with Limited Data. Mm -hmm. And like what you want is of those 130,000, which are the ones that would be worth sending to a human to verify? So it is a mechanism of understanding which ones you think should actually, like it might give you back a 10% list that you would then, instead of using the AFIN table, actually use a person to do the classification that who would understand nuance a bit better. And there's a whole report on how to select which are the ones that are the ones that you should be using there so that you it, it helps manage cost and helps manage like things that way. Okay, great. Yeah, actually, that, that's a good point. That fast forward labs content um, is something maybe one of the one of the production guys in the back can maybe add a, a comment to the feeds um, linking to those reports. We have a series of really incredible reports, you know, done by professional data scientists around some of these very hard machine learning challenges. And, you know, especially some of the ethical implications of some of them, which I find, you know, particularly compelling and a lot of, you know, practical suggestions for how to tackle these hard things. So if, uh, if we can't uh, find a link to that um, whilst we are live streaming, we will do so after. Um, so look for that. Um, I had something to say at that point, <laughs> but I've forgotten. Oh, actually, no, yeah, I, what I wanted to say was um, that that's extremely interesting as well for me because I like to think of AI more as like augmented intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence. I think there's serious value in being able to give decision support to humans or to automate as much as possible and filter down the number of decisions that humans have to make. Um, you know, because I think that can really help us progress. I'm not sure aiming for perfect artificial intelligence is, you know, realistic or useful. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, like, it's also one of those somewhat uh, non-completely described terms. I think of AI as, uh, like, things that is a service. So to me, that final thing would be an AI. You give it a sentence, it gives you a result. You don't know what's happening in the background. It is, like, it's... Is artificial in that it is created by machines, but prior to that is machine learning. So 
I think the thing that most people think about is AI is that end result. It's sort of the magic that I give it something and it tells me it's a picture of a cat. Machine learning is everything to get up to that point. So it is the wrapper around it, creating it from like the boring science part, not boring, boring for some people science part, that then gets up to the bit at the end, which is the, the magic, which is the AI part. And I think that's probably kind of like cloud was very badly de uh, uh, described at the start. Everything was cloud. Now we know it's machines owned by AWS and Azure. So same thing for AI. AI, I think, is eventually going to get to that point um, where it's just the services that do a thing um, almost magically. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but actually, black box machine learning algorithms, a whole other ethical yeah, situation. Yeah. yeah, we don't have to go there either. But, you know, we actually did have some questions around, you know, uh, critiques of the usage of AI, and I think you know from um, from Reginald in there. So I think we, we've touched on a couple of those those topics. Um, we had a we had a, a nice question: Can we use the algorithms that you've shown today to detect if a date is actually interested in you or not during the date? <laughs> Sentiment analysis. <laughs> I'm going to say no. <laughs> I mean, on my code. <laughs> I don't know, maybe like, hmm, there's just a whole lot of issues. I can't really see it happening. You know, you, you, you've probably got to do like uh, speech to text, transliteration, then get an alert. Like, she's not yeah. into you, you know? Oh. <laughs> also, ask. <laughs> you know, maybe speak to your date. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And then they'll like you. Uh <laughs> yeah, like instead, I mean, that's very, very direct inference. <laughs> <laughs> you look sometimes we don't need computers um yeah. so <laughs> um there actually were some practical questions too around um uh how you prepared your data so um uri and esra were having a little bit of a discussion on linkedin around are you standardizing the data set or normalizing it it seems that there's a nuance between the two words and what implications do they have to the work that you did so for the word to vec model, I am standardizing. For the BERT model, it has a normalizer function, so I'm doing that. So there is a data, like the pipeline, the, the starting point is the first thing is I create text, raw text, and its score. So that's my sentiment scores thing. Then the word to vec model goes through its own process, and it happens to run uh, standardization. Um, and the BERT model, as part of the John Snow Labs, has no... Um, normalization as its process. Okay, all right. Hope that answered um, some of the discussion there, Uri and Esra. Uh, we've also got um, Alok on YouTube asking around, can we do ABSA, which is aspect-based sentiment analysis in R? Have you seen that? Have you encountered that? Have so you seen that in R? The most advanced NLP stuff in Spark is happening in the Jon Snow Labs Spark NLP libraries. If it exists there, then that's the most likely place for it to exist. I haven't specifically seen it. I know that they do lots of different kinds of word embeddings, and they also, so they do Glove, they do uh, like the universal sentence encoding, they do BERT, and it then creates it either as a word-based system or a sentence-based system. Whether they have that there or not, I don't know. But that would be the place I'd look. OK, great. Maybe we can introduce that in the next phase of your demo as well. Um, two more questions, a little bit more on you know, the actual analytics we're doing, because you know it's all well and good, the code, but you know the insights that we're getting, um, which may be quite fun for you as a um, Simpsons fan. So Fraser on YouTube asking, you know, it would be cool to see how the character's average sentiment changed over the course of seasons. You know, do they get yeah, more happy or more <laughs> sad? Especially yeah. he's saying, uh, it does making Homer increasingly stupid also make him more happy? You know, maybe proving ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice that's a nice adjustment that's uh like it's a, a fun data set to play with yeah and then also rosie fishka on youtube you know looking at maybe different writers on different episodes whether you know they have a a way to uh, an implication on on the happiness of the character and uh, maybe an indication on the mood of the writer at the time you know, who knows? Yeah, and like different writers are going to write for the same character so mm -hmm. like would there be a clustering that would be something that would be interesting say like a k-means algorithm mm -hmm. so um you would kind of we would need to update the data set because the data set doesn't include any concept of time at the moment it's just like character and text so we would have to go and add 
episode um, and date to it, so date ed. And then we could run a clustering algorithm that would go and say, like, we find that Mo, when written by, I think Conan O'Brien was one of the writers at some point, like the, he writes him happily, but Matt Groening, who is the creator and also a writer, writes him a little bit more sad. You could actually cluster that. So you could create this sort of thing to say, certain writers take, create happier characters, other writers don't. You could actually take and like abstract this quite a lot more, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, maybe that's, you know, in another episode of this yeah. meetup, we can do awesome. some additional analysis. You'll need a you'll need a, uh, <laughs> um, an enriched data set, which also is another thing that data scientists have to do, data set enrichment. How do yeah. we join table, you know, how do we join our data sets properly? How do we ensure the governance, for example? I think that's just, yeah, let's maybe do a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's that's, ooh, that's that's all we got time for. I think the, the production guys are waving at me to, uh, to stop um, and probably what I will do is flip over to the moment we've all been waiting for, which is the uh, raffle <laughs> for the prizes. Um, so with that, give me a second to make sure we have all of the names in the name picker and to share my screen. Technical difficulties, we need some like transition music or something. <laughs> Okay, here we are. This is the the thing. So as a reminder, we have two prizes. We have a uh, two goodie bags, right? So I'm gonna pick from these names. I think these are all the names that are there. I'm gonna pick two names. First person's gonna win the first prize. Second person's gonna win the second prize. And I think as a, uh, as a reminder of, sorry, of the, prizes what we have here is this very tasteful hoodie t-shirt and a really nice duffel bag and the second place is a couple t-shirts same water bottle and a good like speaker and tote bag little set so all of you who have participated and asked questions you are in with a chance let's choose a winner for pack number one Rosie Fish, the possibly competitive Simpsons fan to you, Jeff. I think that's, you know, maybe maybe you guys need to like meet and do battle, but at a safe distance. Uh, the second prize. So yeah, so Rosie, um, we'll probably have one of one of our team um, reach out to you, but there is a, uh, an email address, I think it's social media at cladera.com who you can email with um, your details so we can get in touch. Second prize, so the t-shirts and the speaker, goes to da -da -da, Dave Goodhand, congrats. Same thing, uh, we will reach out to you for your uh, prize and um, stay on the line for the community team to reach out to you. So with that, um, I think that's, that's pretty much the end. We have a... Uh, Following meetups, um, if you are interested in what you have seen, the uh, next meetup is going to be next Wednesday around an introduction to big data warehousing. It's in uh, central US time. I don't know what that is in GMT, I think possibly minus six. So calculate that how it goes. And then if you are interested in streaming uh, on the 24th of February, we have another of the future of data teams using Apache and I find Kafka to stream and collect data into the cloud. So some really, really good practical sessions, uh, probably not gonna be about The Simpsons. We are not affiliated with The Simpsons or Fox Broadcasting in any way. <laughs> so that is that. Is that. Um, we have put the uh, code in, um, we've put a link to uh, Jeff's code in LinkedIn and on YouTube. Um, so if you want to try out any of this stuff and expand on it, I'm sure Jeff would be really happy to take pull requests as well. Um, so see you next time.